Land acknowledgement. As we gather together, we acknowledge the sacred land on the Yeah. Are you wanted it? Site of human for fifteen thousand years. This land is the territory of the Huron Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of Dish with One Spoon Wampoon Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this gathering place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Last but certainly not least, we acknowledge the people of African descent who were brought here against their own will or in search of a safe place to live their lives and raise their children. Reconnaissance des terres. En nous rassemblant, nous reconnaissons la terre sacrée sur laquelle nous résidons. C'est un site d'activité humaine depuis 15 000 ans. Cette terre est le territoire des Premières Nations, Huron, Wandat et Petun, les Séniques et plus récemment les Nisessaga de la, Crédit, de la rivière Crédit. Le territoire était sujet de l'alliance de la ceinture wampum plat avec cuillère, une accord entre la Confédération Iroquois et confédération des Ojibwe et des nations alliées à partager et à prendre soin pacifiquement pour les ressources autour des Grands Lacs. Aujourd'hui, ce lieu de rassemblement est toujours le foyer de nombreux peuples autochtones de toute l'île de la Tortue et nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir la possibilité de travailler dans la communauté sur ce territoire. Nous sommes également conscients des alliances brisées et de la nécessité de nous efforcer de guérir toutes nos relations. Dernier point, mais non le moindre, nous remercions les personnes d'ascendance africaine qui ont été amenées ici contre leur volonté ou à la recherche d'un endroit sûr où vivre leur vie et élever leurs enfants. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good morning in some cases. I am coming to you from uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba today. Uh, my name is Ross Kadas, and I am the president of the Black Business and Professional Association. And today we have a very special uh, edition of Ask a Professional, which is a day in the life of a great company, Hoop. Now, you may ask, why are you in, in Winnipeg, Manitoba? The BBPA has, uh, currently has an outreach tour that we're doing across Canada to work with small businesses, small black owned businesses across Canada to give them the supports that they need. So we are here in cold, uh, cold Winnipeg and we are looking forward to meeting with the businesses there. Now, uh, today, as I said, we will be we will be um, we will be uh, meeting some of the great people at Hoop and getting to learn a little bit more about Hoop, um, a company that um, that works with pension plans in Canada. Uh, if you just a few housekeeping rules, can you keep your 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 um, can you keep muted on, unless you have a question? And if you do have a question, you can, you can uh, either put it in the chat below um, or you can raise your hand and my colleague uh, Kimberly would be more than happy to un unmute you. In the meantime, let's get to know our folks at Hoop. I'd like to start off by um, um, asking each member of the panel today um, to introduce themselves, but also to give us uh, an idea as to why, why Hoop? Why did they, how did they, how did they get uh, the opportunity to work with Hoop? 
And we can start with the Chief Investment Officer, Michael Wizzle. Michael? Great. Great. Thanks very much. And I'm, I'm very appreciative to have the opportunity to speak to the, all the people on the call. And, it, and, and I think your question is um, a really good one because I just don't think the pension industry, which um, offers phenomenal careers across an, a, a very wide spectrum of, of activities, is widely known by people. And I think awareness is really what you know, your group is doing um, so effectively to broaden and widen out to people that might not have come across the pension industry in their day to day for themselves or for their children. Um, you know, hopefully through the through the this call, we can we can uh, make the case that uh, for some of those folks, Hoop might be an interesting uh, an interesting place. And 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 from my own perspective, I come from a very humble background. I I read about the at the bottom of the Ottawa Citizen in 1985 about uh, it was a day in the life just to be uh, of a of a, F, a foreign exchange trader. And went on to have a career at TD Bank and then left TD Bank in 2002 to join um, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan and then joined uh, Hoop here in 2018. And, and um, my point is, is that, you know, who was talking about pension industry? Um, it's just not sort of a top of mind thing. It's maybe a thing we take for granted. But um, certainly at Hoop, um, you know, we're managing and stewarding the pension uh, for 410,000 working and retired members of the healthcare uh, profession. And, and, and I would be remiss by not um, suggesting that even while these healthcare workers are taking care of us during these crazy pandemic um, years, uh, one thing they don't have to worry about is their retirement security. And that is, you know, our, our focus is sort of each and, each and every day. So um, I came to Hoop um, from, from teachers uh, to join what was a small team and we were talking a little bit before we got going about the growth that's going on within Hoop. The investment management team, when I joined in 2018, was 60 people. We're 110 now. We'll be 130 by the end of next year. And we could be 150, 170 people in the, in the years to come. So this is very much a company that's growing. Um, and, and, and that's true, not just in the investment management uh, area where, where I work more, most closely, but really across all the facets that, that make up Hoop. Uh, I believe we're over 900 people now, and once again, really growing. So I'm really glad that we can uh, um, introduce Hoop to, to the people on the call, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thanks so much, Michael. And uh, we'll move on to Nikki Pitt, Director of Learning and Development. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us um, how you came to work at Hoop? Oh gosh, so my career journey, so I'm Nikki Pitt, my pronouns are she, her, and um, I would say I definitely stumbled into Hoop and I'm eternally grateful for stumbling into Hoop. So it's interesting when Mike mentioned, Michael just mentioned the fact that he was reading in a paper. When I think about starting my career, I think how fortunate we are to have this medium for people to hear about places. Like I was literally looking for jobs in newspapers, Michael too, um, you know, trying to find what's out there. Um, but over the years, um, when I stumbled into banking where I spent a lot of my career, I had reached a point, and I actually have a career planning flowchart. Ross, if you're ever interested, I'll share it with you. And that flowchart has changed over the years. And I remember at one time, about three, or about three years or so, I went out to lunch with former colleagues of mine from the bank. And they were just talking about, they work at Hoop. And they were talking about Hoop. And I was like, what's this place? What is this place that has um, seven well-being days? What is this place that has a gym in the building that they can go to? What is this place that brings in these thought leaders? And I, I was sitting there thinking, I'd love to work there. And, you know, it started to craft my career uh, planning flowchart and adding some of the characteristics that this organization seemed to feed, but it just felt like a pipe dream. And for, fast forward to like about four years later, in the middle of a pandemic, an opportunity opens up at a place that ticks all the boxes on my career planning flowchart. And, um, you know, I went through the process, I spoke to the recruiter, 
the end to end was amazing. Just finding out that they have these employee resource groups. And in that process, I actually got invited to attend. Um, I'll never forget this, Travis, because Travis is on this call. And I remember seeing Travis in this speaker series. I saw Michael. I saw a lot of people who are here. And we had this speaker series. We had a gentleman named Anthony McLean. And he was talking in February, I believe. I, I can't remember when it was. Travis, you can remind everyone. And I saw Travis sitting there with his, his child on his lap. And I saw masses of employees listening to hear about the Black experience. And I thought to myself, this is the place for me. It fits my values. It um, just hits every note. And um, I have been here for a year. And it's, been, it's, it's exceeded every expectation I've had. I feel genuinely that I can bring my true self to work. And that's not something that happens a lot, especially in a pandemic. So eternally grateful, wonderful place to be. And Ross, thanks for having this. I think this is so wonderful that people get an opportunity to get some authentic insider information on what it's like to work in a pension plan. Yes, you know, where do I sign up, Nikki? I mean, you, you, you now I'm sold. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, and now we will, we'll, we'll have Michael Regis introduce himself. Michael. Hey, um, so I'm Michael. I'm the director of equity, diversity and inclusion here at Hoop. I've been here for seven months now, and it's my first position in the pension space, in the financial space. So, um, I was actually working for Indigenous Services before I came here, and many of my role in, in an EDI role, um, advising in that role, and uh, and so many of my most of my positions in the EDI EDI space were in public sector or nonprofit, and I was reached out to by recruitment. I I, I knew nothing about Hoop before that time. Um, I was recently came back to Ontario after being at West for six years. So, um, and so I met with. Um, a few people I met with Nikki was Nikki was there Michael was there as well and uh, I met with a lot of people within the organization and so I started to get for me in the EDI space and we'll talk more about EDI in a second uh, with when, with the other questions but it was really really important for me to be coming into an organization that was serious about EDI equity diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. so um, after meeting uh, hearing telling people that I've been reached out to about who and hearing what other people what people were saying about who and after meeting the team I started getting the impression of the the investment of of uh, who you can't really know exactly what you're going to be coming into until you actually start so once I it was confirmed that I was I was hired I, I was reached out to by a lot of uh, hoopsters a lot of employees through LinkedIn set, telling me that they're happy I'm coming and saying saying we got work to do and all the, all this stuff. So to me, that was like, I've never heard that in terms of EDNI, that's level of safety that people have in reaching out to me personally. So that, so I it was, it made me nervous at the same time excited. So, so just that investment that's, and uh, the, the culture of people seem really happy. And uh, so that's what drew me into it. So it's been great, really great so far. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Joanne non Nonco, who is the production lead of marketing and communications. Joanne, would you introduce yourself? You're on mute. Thank you. I told myself I'd take myself off with mute and I did not. <laughs> <laughs> so as Ross said, I'm uh, Joanne Nonco. I'm the production lead on the creative services team within the marketing and communications department. And in terms of how I came to Hoop, I can definitely um, relate to a couple of things that uh, my colleagues have mentioned. Um, I'm definitely one of those people that Michael mentioned that isn't aware of the pension industry. Um, like Nikki, I kind of stumbled into Hoop. I wasn't really aware of Hoop, to be honest, um, before I learned of the role that I applied for and, and eventually got. So I like to describe it kind of as, kind of as a happy accident that I landed here. Um, so when I applied for that job, um, I'd only been in Toronto for about two years. I grew up and went to university in Ottawa, having studied communications and visual arts. So um, the financial services industry just wasn't really on my radar, to be honest. Um, so when I moved to Toronto, my job prior to Hoop was as a junior communications associate at Havergal College, uh, which is an independent girls school. And my boss there, um, who I had a great working relationship with, she actually left Howard Go and came to Hoop. 
um, to fulfill the role of uh, director of marketing of the marketing department, which was new at the time. Um, so we had stayed in touch. She knew that I was interested in gaining more experience, particularly in the production, uh, print production uh, coordination area. And so this role at Hoop came up that would involve more of that work. Uh, she told me about it. I applied. I got the job. And uh, so, yeah, kind of a happy accident. I stumbled into Hoop. But I've been here for 12 years now, and it's been a great experience. And there are definitely some things about Hoop that has kept me here. Um, definitely just the opportunity to always um, grow and to get involved in a whole range of projects. Um, my department has grown quite a bit uh, over the past 12 years. And with that, you know, we service a lot of our um, internal departments and provide marketing communications support there. So that's really exposed me and us to a lot of different opportunities to get involved in different projects and develop our skill set um, and just really grow. Um, and it's just a great place to work. Honestly, my team is the best group of people I could ever ask to work for. The benefits are great at Hoop. So very happy accident to, to have sampled here. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Joanna. And I know Michael referred to um, referred to um, a Hoop employee as a Hoopster. So we're going to be using that through, through our conversation today. But last but not least, Tra Travis, would you introduce yourself and, and give us your why? Absolutely. Th thank you, Ross. Uh, my name is Travis Wright. Uh, I've been a hoopster for over 17 years. Can, can we? Yeah, I think you're good now. Is that better? We're, we're good. We're good. Okay, yes. great. Yeah, so uh, just to reiterate, because I didn't get too far, but I'm Travis Wright. Yeah. been a hoopster for 17 years. Uh, I believe I have one of the most rewarding jobs at Hoop. My current title is a stakeholder outreach manager. So I manage the relationships with our healthcare unions. So I'm in the community. I attend events, conferences. Uh, I, I go on site to the employers. So I directly interact with our membership. So I educate them, uh, inform them about their pension plan. I work directly with our amazing membership, helping them on their journey into retirement. Um, as Nikki mentioned, that speaker series event that she was talking about, that was last year, summer of 2020. And yes, I had my daughter on my lap because to me, this organization is, it's much more than just an employer. It's, it's honestly like family. I've made so many great connections at this place. Uh, I, I met my wife at this place and we got married and some members who are probably in the audience right now stood by me as groomsmen at, at my wedding. So... I mean, this place is just fabulous. So many of us also have family that are recipients of this amazing pension plan. For me, it's really close to home. It's my mother. She was a nurse for 30 plus years and she's probably the happiest retiree in the world. <laughs> and a lot of that is because of who. Uh, how did I get started here? Just like everybody else, I kind of stumbled. It's amazing how like one small moment can change your entire life trajectory. I was just out of school, you know, just kind of bumming around and, uh, a friend of mine at the time signed me up for a job agency. So Omer's actually called me, and this is before cell phones, so I'm aging myself here. I got a call on my landline at home, and I just happened to be home to take that call to come into work for one day, one single day to do some administrative work for Omer's. Uh, they liked me for some reason, and <laughs> that one day changed into a week, changed into a month, changed into a few years of which I made some connections. When my contract had finally ended, uh, the person I was working with directly at Omer's had moved over to Hoop and reached out to me and said, hey, come join me at this organization. Uh, it's a great place to work. And as they say, the rest is history. I've been there ever since and very, very grateful, grateful and, uh, and, and thankful for this opportunity. That is awesome. And Travis, I want to stick with you um, because now that we've, we've, we've met everybody else, I want to I want to ask you, like many of our viewers today are wondering, uh, who is Hoop? What is Hoop? Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, can you tell us um, who, who you are and, and whom you serve as an organization? Uh, sure. I mean, I'm so proud to work at Hoop and I could probably go on for hours <laughs> about what we do. But the short version is we are the Healthcare of Ontario Pension Plan. So we're one of the largest pension plans in Canada. 
our driving purpose really is to provide healthcare workers with a financially secure retirement. I mean, you can ask anyone who's an employee of this wonderful organization, and they will tell you that we have a specific and singular focus that drives everything we do, and that is to secure the pension promise. That means once a person retires, they'll receive a monthly pension from Hoop for as long as they live. So no Hoop member outlives their pension. Uh, to give you a little bit of history on us, we were established back in 1960 with a specific focus to serve the healthcare community. So we started with about $10 million of assets under management, approximately 70 participating healthcare organizations, uh, about 11,000 total members. And we have grown exponentially since. We now have net assets of just over $100 billion. And we have 600 plus participating employers and over 400,000 total members. So we do operate as a private independent trust on a not-for-profit basis. And our sole fiduciary, fiduciary duty is to act in the best interest of our plan members. So one of our most important features and something that we're most proud of is that Hoop is fully funded, meaning that we have more than enough money in our pension fund to pay all the pensions we've promised. So the 400,000 plus members in our plan, as Michael uh, and mentioned earlier, they have no reason to worry, no reason to fret. Their pension will be taken care of and they will receive it for as long as they live. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Travis. And um, as I can already see, looking at the, the team before me, that, you know, Hoop, and I, I said this earlier to the team and back uh, backstage, is that I, uh, my, my interaction with, with Hoop over the years is that they've, they hire the best people. Not the best available people, but the absolute best people. And you got you on the call a testimony to that. So I'd like to move to uh, Michael W. If you don't mind me calling you Michael W., uh, I have a question for you. You've you 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 seem, based on your introduction, to be the longest um, um, employee on the call. What what makes a successful hoopster, and and what do you love most about your job? If you're calling me the oldest, that's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, and and and. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'll speak from um, um, an investment management perspective because certainly there's lots of different functions represented on the call today. But from from that sort of investment management perspective, what makes a successful employee? Um, you know, there's a bunch of things that I'll call necessary but not sufficient conditions. So you've got to be, you know, you, um, you know, you have to have good grades and you have to be good at, you know, uh, academics and those kinds of things. But to be honest, those aren't the things that define real success. Um, I think the thing you have to understand about investing is that, and, and people probably can think of it through their own lives, just in terms of managing their own money. It's when do you lose a bunch of money? Well, you tend, you tend to lose a bunch of money when something happens that you didn't consider. So we would say those in, in, in investing parlance, you know, your, your unknown unknowns. Um, so the key thing to think about investing is it's a team sport. And this, why, this is why diversity um, is so key to winning at investing. And it's diversity across all the spectrums, diversity of perspectives, diversity of kinds of personalities that people have. There's room for almost everybody in an investment um, team because you're looking for somebody that's going to have that perspective that the team didn't already have. So, um, you know, I would say if you think about success in, in investing, it's you've got to have comfort working in a team and you've got to be willing to speak up and share with your ideas. And if everybody does that, though it's much less likely that we're going to have those unknown unknowns, much less likely that something that adversely affects our portfolio that we didn't consider. So comfort in working with the team, but also the, you know, the, um, uh, the responsibility to speak up and share your ideas. Those are the core dynamics that allow us to, uh, to make money because the first rule of making money is not losing money. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I know, you know, Travis uh, earlier this uh, mentioned that, uh, and, and Nikki said, Travis had his child on, on his lap. And I know COVID has really changed. Uh, the pandemic changed the way we, we, we do business, the way we interact as teams. Um, I know a number of organizations went virtual um, and, and some are still virtual. 
um, you know, but it's also not only disrupted the way we live, but the way we do business. So Joanne, um, how has Hoop as a company and you as an employee reacted to all of this disruption over the last almost 24 months? Mm -hmm. um, I think Hoop re reacted very quickly and it felt very seamless, to be honest, um, to the pandemic. I often think back to that day in March last year when we were all told to go home midday and we didn't know when we would see each other again that type of thing was such an odd feeling um but I feel like we were kind of back at work the next day online in a virtual environment it just felt very seamless I think Hoop was very quick to react um I think on that on that technical level um we were all back online I know our IT department is working hard behind the scenes to make sure that transition is very seamless I think um Aside from that, um, something that Hoop is very proud of is the culture and really supporting employees. And I feel like that has not been lost at all working in this, uh, in, in this virtual environment. Things like um, town halls, org-wide town halls, or even divisional town halls have transitioned into the virtual environment very well. So we still have those opportunities to meet as a large group and, um, you know, have that dialogue, have that connection uh, with our, our leadership and with our teams. Um, you know, I think initiatives, when it comes to the culture, Hoop is also very much um, supportive when it comes to health and wellness as well. And we have a Thrive program, for example, which is a whole program of activities that support health and wellness. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Joanne, you're you're on mute. Again, I don't know how to. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Was I on mute for a long time? No, just for a minute. <laughs> sorry about yeah, that. That's okay. So I was just uh, speaking about the Thrive program, which is a health and wellness um, program that uh, is provided to to employees as a support. So very impressed with how well even that has transitioned well to a virtual environment. Things that we would do in the office like lunch and learns or yoga sessions, meditation has transitioned really well to a virtual environment. So I think HIP has really maintained um, the interest in providing support to employees even in a virtual environment and really transition that well um, to, to that environment. I think in some ways we've even done more in this virtual environment. We've always had a series of guest speakers, which is a great opportunity to just be educated on a whole bunch of topics, ranging from mental health to diversity inclusion. Nikki mentioned the speaker session with Anthony McLean, um, internet security, all those types of things. So I feel like we've had even more opportunities to have um, those educational sessions in a virtual environment because I think it's just easier, right? Like um, to bring people in from all over the place. They don't have to be in the office. So there's just been a, a, a large range um, of opportunity there. Um, also from a hoop perspective, I have found that management has been very supportive and understanding of the difficulties in working in this virtual environment within a pandemic and how challenging that can be on a personal level as well and adapting to this uh, virtual environment and been encouraging of making sure we maintain a work-life balance. We're not, you know, working so much that we're leading to burnout and reminding us to take vacation, things like that. So on that level, Hoop has transitioned very well and been very supportive. Um, on a personal level, I do feel like I've made the most of working in this environment. I I enjoy working from home. I'm very much an introvert. So I find working from home uh, allows me kind of the space and the focus um, to work without having kind of some of that buzz of activity uh, interruptions that happen in the office. Um, I do miss my colleagues and, and seeing them in person, so I'm not saying that, but uh, I think we've made the most of the situation for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh... You know, talking to a number of different organizations, um, there are the virtual coffees and the virtual drinks, and that became the norm on a Friday afternoon for some of some of, some organizations where they would have a drink.
together, everybody would have a glass of wine virtually, and that would be how how they would they would connect as a team outside of the work environment. So, very very interesting, and and I think uh, the change will be with us forever um, uh, as we as we get used to it. Um, businesses and, and 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 this one's for you, Nikki. Businesses and individuals in our community have really been hit hard by by the pandemic. In addition to the challenges that uh, uh, that we faced um, due to um, uh, racial and systemic barriers, can you speak on how Hoop is 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 helping during this recovery phase? Yeah. So one of the things that I, I definitely want to point out is that um, since I've been at Hoop, I you know it's funny. Coincidentally, Travis was one of the reasons that I came over to Hoop, just seeing him in that situation. And we have the pleasure of partnering um, in these onboarding sessions that we do on a quarterly basis for new employees. So we bring Travis in and he talks. And, you know, I was reflecting on the last onboarding session that we had. And it's so clear to all of us at Hoop. And it, what makes me proud about working at Hoop is our mission you know, to deliver on the pension promise. So we, it's important to remember that, you know, for us, our pension members are the healthcare workers who have worked tirelessly in Ontario. So, you know, the nurses, the hospital workers that are supporting us through this, this pandemic. So one of the things I thought about was, you know, what have we been doing? And in the last onboarding session, when Travis came, he shared a lot of really great things that left me and the other employees saying, I can't believe we're doing this. So I'm going to make Travis come back on to tell us what he shared <laughs> at that onboarding session. Yeah. Travis, yeah, please share. Let us, what did you share at your onboarding session? Sorry, just unmuting. Um... Well, I mean, it's been exceptionally challenging for our healthcare workers uh, throughout this pandemic. Uh, you know, we just talked about how many organizations have just adapted smoothly, shifting to working from home. But many of our membership, they actually had no choice but continue to going into work every day. So at Poop, obviously, we support our membership by delivering on the pension promise. Um, but we also try to make the process of retiring as seamless as possible. So we've had to shift our in-person events to online. So we've done webinars, education sessions. Uh, we help members learn about the retirement process. And we have dedicated staff at Hoop, at, uh, you know, uh, member advisors where you can call in and get information uh, tailored directly to your specific needs. Uh, prior to the pandemic, I mean, we frequently visit our membership on site at hospitals. Uh, we supported employee events, activities like nursing week. Since that option has been available to us, we've tried our best to continue to support these events virtually. We actually asked our nurses, you know, how can we still provide support without physically being present? And surprisingly, and, and very humbly, they just requested small items like mints or badge pulleys or lanyards for their ID or, or hoop pens. If you've ever heard about these hoop pens, they're legendary in the healthcare universe. Uh, so sometimes it's just the little things that mean a lot. So continually finding ways to provide support where we could has just been key and, and keeping that dialogue open with our leadership at uh, the, our various employers and with our unions to just ask them, what can we do and respond to their needs? Excellent. Excellent. So if you're just, if you're just joining us, we are inside a, a day in the life of Hoop um, and we're just getting to know uh, this company a lot, uh, a lot better. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand, your virtual hand, or enter the question in the chat. And my colleague, uh, Kimberly, would be able to, um, would be able to, to, to pick on you. And there, there we go, one hand up, um, our, our humble treasurer, Michael Pinnock. Um, you can unmute your, your mic and ask a question, sir. Thank you, my president, and thanks to the team from Oops. Um, I'm a numbers guy, and one of the things I always look for when I go on these Zoom sessions is the number of participants. And I can tell you, the last number I saw was 133. And I think that's a record for arts professional midweek, midday. I'm um, saying so a lot of folks are here because it's very, very interesting. 
Uh, look, the question I have, uh, just looking at the participation rate and listening to the presentation, that it clearly is very successful in delivering true health care, the pension plan. Now, we work with a lot of small and mid-sized Black-owned business. And um, we talk about, you know, the transfer of wealth and pension and so on. Is there any plan for you folks to, to, to what is it now, die? diversify, go into another space to do pension planning, for example, in the small and mid-sized businesses and probably not-for-profit organization? Because clearly you're very, very successful in the health and where you're at right now. So it's a good basis of franchising if there's such an ability to do so. So that's my question. Is there any plans to, that we, for example, in the BBPA can look forward to that another year or two, we may be able to buy pension plan troops for our small and mid-sized businesses. Uh, Mike, uh, Michael, Michael, Michael W., do you want to take I can one? take a, sta a stab at it. The short, <laughs> the short answer is um, we're very active in advocating for pensions. I mean, Hoop is, uh, what we see one of our responsibilities is, you know, we, we call it, you know, pooled savings. There's just a tremendous amount of advantages to saving for your retirement as you know, as um, uh, as a collective, as a as a group, rather than an individual. I don't know how long I'm going to live, but if you put, you know, ten thousand people like me together, we we get pretty close to within a couple of months of how long we'll live as a collective. What if, you know, what if I retire in 2007, just before 2008, and I'm saving for myself? Well, that's really, you know, that's really hard. But when you when you share that. Uh, over over decades, you know the 2008s aren't really as prob you know problematic. So there's there's a you know there's a lot of reasons why th there's a lot of discipline that you know as individuals you know we get nervous we get scared um, that once again when you share that over decades isn't quite as ner you know um, frightening and 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 leads to better quite frankly better returns. So we're constantly advocating for um, the pension industry and 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 ensuring that people have access to pensions. Specifically with regards to Hoop, our focus is only on the healthcare. Now, I think Michael mentioned we have 600 employers, so, so we've widened out the definition. And I would turn it, uh, or maybe it was Travis that mentioned, sorry, the you know the number of employers, and we've got a wider group. But I don't, I don't see Hoop widening beyond the healthcare sector. We think that um, you know that's that's our niche and and our and our sole focus at this time. But we are broadening the definition of healthcare to include some employers that maybe weren't, um, you know, part of the part of the remit beforehand. So I don't know. The, yes to pensions. Uh, yes to healthcare workers. Um, um, but I don't. I don't think it's going any further than that. Uh, and thanks, Mike. But I can tell you, working in the black space is stressful, and can be defined <laughs> as a healthcare area that you may want to work in. So um, if we stretch our imagination a little more and <laughs> add a few words to the definition, <laughs> I'm certain, you know, working in the mid, small and mid-sized black industry will quite, uh, at least- Travis is your advocate. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> but, but I do I do think there's a need here for you guys to just listen to what you're saying, how you do it and the participation we're having. And, you know, from where we sit, we'll, we'll probably come and try to, have discussions with you down the road to see to what extent uh, we may get you encouraged to do something on our behalf. Thank you. Travis, I, thanks, Michael. Travis, I see you had your hand up. You want to weigh into this uh, question? Yeah, and just to, to, to tag on to this, um, we actually have a wealth of information and we've done a lot of research partnering with third party organizations uh, about how organizations can find better ways to provide more efficient and effective ways of saving for retirement for their employees. Um, if you go to our website, you'll see a wealth of research. We just recently did something about the value of a good pension plan from the employer's perspective. Um, so without taking up too much time, Michael, um, feel free to connect with me after this event, but have a go at our website, uh, at the research, and or, sorry, in the advocacy page. You'll find a wealth of information and research about what Hoop is doing to provide that information so more Canadians can have access to these amazing vehicles. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to stick with uh, Michael uh, W. Um, just, just to talk a little bit about the pension industry. 
You know, it comes with a lot of moving parts in its ecosystem that could be really challenging given use of so many different groups within um, organization and also personalities within healthcare and different roles within healthcare. Uh, in your experience, what is the most challenging part of your industry and how do you manage it? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, you know, I thought about this is a great question and I, and I thought about it a lot and there's, and there's, um, um, you know, there's a couple of things that I think are really kind of key in our industry. One is like to manage the portfolio itself, which is about 110 billion now. Um, one of the challenges we have is that breadth of expertise that we need. I mean, I think people have put it in the chat. We have $15 billion in the real estate. Uh, business. Then we have an equity derivatives area. We have a public equities area, fixed income area, um, a credit area, a private equity area. Uh, we're building an infrastructure business, and and that breadth of skills and expertise, which is which is underpinning our growth, um, is is I think one of the challenges. So you know, being able to sort of put all of those pieces together into one. Uh, common purpose, which is earning a sufficient rate of return to keep the print in promise. That's that's probably for me the the day to day challenge. I think I think the broader challenge for the pension industry is what we call intergenerational fairness, which is and, and Travis alluded to this. We're all fully funded right now. You know how much do we want to save some of that fully funded for safety and soundness for the next generation? How much do we want to maybe possibly improve benefits in the near term? How much are we worrying about 30 years from now? How much are we worrying about 30 months from now or 30 days from now? And managing that because our, 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 our lens is so long, we think out 50, 60, 70 years. So the, you know, I would say from a day-to-day -day perspective, my, our biggest challenge in managing the investment portfolio is the breadth that it represents. And as a pension industry is managing um, both, you know, near term and decades from now uh, through the uh, ensuring that we're being uh, fair across generations. Yeah, yeah, that, that totally, totally makes sense. Um, when, when we think of, you know, the last 12 months or 18 months and what happened in um, corporate, corporate North America, with regards to that shift in um, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion uh, as part of a strategy for, for most companies. And it started for a lot of companies um, uh, with the murder of George Floyd in the US. I think Corporate Canada woke up and we said, listen, we want to do more. Um, Michael Regis being the new uh, director of uh, uh, equity and inclusion, the diversity, equity, inclusion. What is what what is Hoop doing differently in its strategy to encourage a more inclusive environment for its employees? Uh, thank you for that question, Ross. Um, I just first mentioned that Travis is here as well to to back to back up this discussion, and Travis is our is our co-chair for our Black ERG. Uh, Safi is on, on our other co-chairs who's on maternity leave right now. And uh, Michael Whistle is our executive sponsor for our Black ERG. We have five employee resource groups um, out in proud culture champions making her story our Black ERG. And uh, and yeah, I think I got all of them there. But Travis can back me up if I forgot one. Maple, but, multicultural. Maple, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, our, our multicultural ERG. So, um, one thing being in the space for a few for for a year, few years now, the it's important for organizations. One thing that we're gonna, we're, we're trying to figure out this equity, diversity, inclusion space, and uh, and a lot of organizations want to do the right thing, but they don't know what they have to do and the commitment needed. So, for a lot of organizations, it's a, for for most, in my opinion, it's a checkbox. And they want to do the best thing, but it's we're working in a in an industry that should, needs to be taken seriously, and and a lot of organizations don't understand what that means. Uh, it should be as, as, just as any other initiative within an organization, and it can be very sensitive and divisive content. So, um, when developing our five-year strategy, our uh, EDI strategy, we intentionally outlined uh, initiatives that embed EDI in our culture and not just uh, a checkbox. So, the executive team, for example, is it's highly invested in EDI at Hoop. Uh, Michael, Michael, our chief 
chief uh, investment officer is uh, executive champion for our Black ERG, for example. And we have um, each of our executive team, or we have representatives on each of our ERGs who are executive champions or part of our executive team. So um, another key thing that we're just, uh, initiative that we're just completing now is our listening sessions. Um, and it was an opportunity, it's an opportunity for for staff of, of equity seeking groups to express some of the some of the, the things that they experience both inside and inside outside the work environment, whether you're a black um, a woman, uh, part of the LGBTQ2S plus community. So um, and the all the executive team is present, including our CEO for all those sessions. So um, to hear and, and that was a request from our from our staff. So and I I there's I have a I meet with our uh, CEO. Um, quarterly or more if needed. I met with him Monday and, and it's part of our, you know, our successes too. It's a, so, um, and our executive team is also at all our media and I events, not all, all the time, but uh, so that commitment is there. So we also have a reporting, uh, we, we report to our board of our progress in the I, which so our board is holding us, holding us to account of how we're doing and our successes. And another key component that a lot of organizations struggle with within the industry um, is, is metrics, you know, metrics to record progress in, in various initiatives in an organization is imperative, right? So, and equity, diversity, inclusion should be, should be uh, absent from that. So who has committed and we're working on our metrics process right now, and we're, we're very committed to it. And this is just one of the key components of why, what we're doing differently is just, just our level of commitment, so. And if, uh, yeah. And that, that totally makes sense. And I, I, before Travis weighs in, I think uh, just to your point, you know, when we think of diversity and, um, uh, and inclusion in an organization, um, the commitment has to be there at the C-suite, but the education takes place at middle, middle management because the middle manager um, is, the, is the person that typically determines who gets hired in the organization and how, and, and that, people that get hired in the, the organization, typically they, they determines the culture of the organization. So um, I think that's, that's, that's a great, great, great start. Travis, you wanna weigh in? Uh, sure, just to add on to what Michael was saying, I think it's amazing that who has recognized that the black experience, although similar to the multicultural experience, it's, it's decidedly different. Uh, I'm so proud of our organization for taking the necessary steps to address systemic racism and taking the necessary steps to be anti-racist. Um, it, it's amazing that we signed the Black North Pledge. Our CEO personally sent out invitations to his peers at other organizations to encourage them to join the pledge. And, and when I asked HR to share that list with me, they were fully transparent and sent me the specific companies that we actually reached out to. Uh, the creations of the ERG is something also that we've, we've done differently and my, uh, Michael mentioned it. Um, but what I love about our ERGs is Obviously, they're not meant to be polarizing or to divide people or to give one group preferential treatment over the other. It's about giving a voice, giving opportunity to all the groups who need assistance, who need that uplifting for equality amongst us all. And I, I love our co-chairs of the groups. And as mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the Black ERG. Um, we meet monthly. We discuss our challenges, our successes. Uh, we find ways to support each other, uplift each other, and, and we work together. So I just wanted to add that one. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, um, do we have any questions, uh, uh, Kimberly? Any questions from we the? Do, from we do the... have one question. We have a question that came in from Sonil, and the question is: How would you direct us? I'm guessing being small businesses to look more into the accessing of resources, regulation, education, or consulting. Is that in relation to equity, diversity, inclusion? Obviously, yeah. Um, okay, for a small business, I I would reach. There's a lot of great resources out there which are which are free. Um, for example, I in my space when I was in this industry, I worked for organizations that didn't have a lot of resources. And you can reach out to the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion. They have resources that are fit the budget to to anybody. If you want to reach out, it, it's important to network in this space to in terms of acquiring these resources that are needed for your organization. So there's a lot, just 
it's important just to start networking and reaching out to organizations, reach out through LinkedIn to other peers and join equity, diversity, inclusion groups, for example, peer groups. Yeah, and I think the question is more so related to pension and just financial resources in this space for small businesses. I don't know if anyone can answer to that particular question. Um, if not, let's move on to the next question that we have from Linux. Um, Linux asked regarding um, hot procurement, uh, the spend budget, is there a target amount or percent that Hoop is considering to allow Black businesses to supply products and services? And this is a question from Linux. If Linux wants to come on and clarify his question, but that's what he's posted in chat. So, 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 is, is Linux on? Yes, Linux. So, yeah, let me get, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, the question with re regarding to uh, diversity. Um, of your procurement process. Um, I'm a finance executive, um, so I follow the dollars. So, so, um, so we look at the procurement process of hope, and of course your, your procurement budget, I'm gonna pick a number of, of um, a billion dollars every year. You spend a billion dollars a year. Um, does the senior management have an idea of what percentage of that that they're gonna allow that business to participate in either products or services. And do they have a metric they're gonna hold the middle management accountable for? I, I can take a stab at that. If, um, we're a unique business in that we, we procure services, investment services, because we're managing $110 billion, but we don't procure a lot of goods, for example, because essentially we're just a collection of humans. Um, Hoop is is really just a bunch of people that come together to steward to steward the capital and service the members. Um, but I can tell you that our investment partners, when we we are tenaciously um, um, working those relationships to ensure that they're expressing Hoop values, where that, and those values follow the money that we invest. So I'm. Uh, um, so, for example, we don't we won't do an investment unless it it goes through what we call our sustainable investing lens, which includes diversity and inclusion. Um, for example, if we were going to partner with a a management company, we want to know what their diversity and inclusion policies are, and we want to make sure that this is a um, an organization that we're going to be proud to be partners with. So, we are we enable change, and we have um, and this is a, perhaps a unique thing for this pension industry because. Because we control so many dollars, we have the ability to um, demand and require um, um, among other investment organizations that where that money follows, uh, that they're uh, reevaluating, reconsidering and in implementing what we would consider best in class diversity and inclusion um, within their organization. So I can assure you that's, that's something we do do. I think that's something that's only going to continue to grow um, and will continue to be important. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, you know, our biggest impact as an organization is where we invest, and and uh, and I can I can absolutely assure everyone on this call that um, diversity and inclusion is a key consideration as to when we make those investments. Excellent, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, so Neil, you have your hand up. Um, you can uh, unmute yourself to ask your question. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I just want to clarify the question if, if it's possible. Um, so when I'm looking, can you guys hear me properly? Yes, yes, go ahead. Perfect. So what I'm looking at is, understand. I understand that for, you know, marginal, marginalized communities, we go into employment, we want to be able to retire, but we have to wait for a certain period to access those funds. So now as a, a small business that's scaling right now, we're trying to look into opportunities where we're providing our employees pension, but also providing them a security to know that life happens. So able to now have, uh, as I believe it was um, Michael was saying, like a pooled savings where we could now invest their, their monies 
into real estate, into the stocks, into life insurance, to be able to give them ready available access to funds for emergencies. So I was just more or less understanding in the farming industry, a lot of farmers don't have pensions um, secure for the employees or for them themselves as a small business to begin with. So I just wanted to understand what resources that is accessible uh, to someone that's curious about trying to provide pension and retirement stability to the employees. I think, I think Travis touched on that um, earlier. Um, Travis, do you mind uh, uh, um, answering that? Uh, yes, no problem. Yeah, so I mentioned it briefly in an answer previously uh, that on our website, in our advocacy section, we do commission research with third party organizations and, and we come up with these different, uh, they're called value drivers. And um, really they're effective ways of organizations to find ways to pool their money together, as you mentioned. Hoop is a collective of 600 plus organizations, uh, 400,000 plus members. We're all pooling our money together. And really that's the key for organizations. It's almost impossible for a single employer to uh, invest in, 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 in an individual employee's money and, and make that money grow and, success, and be successful. I mean, our, our former CEO, he even mentioned his own personal struggles and challenges with investing on his own. There, there's so much more that comes with a collective partnership. So, so that is the key. Find, and, and that's one of the reasons Hoop is successful because we have our industry, we have our niche, we have our healthcare workers that we support and we found that niche and we continue to invest on behalf of our healthcare membership. So for small businesses, um, the, the challenge is how do you find that same collective? And it, it's so much of a larger discussion, but I just don't wanna derail it too much to get into that. But really take a look at our website and, and look at the research that's been provided on our, under our advocacy section. And our, our contact info is on there. You can reach out directly for more information after that. I appreciate Excellent. that. The, I wasn't sure um, if anything was mentioned before. So thank you for that. No, no problem. Thanks. Thanks, Travis. Thanks to them. Uh, we have Matthew uh, Barker. Matthew had a question. Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. Thank you for the insights. Um, I'm a 1L at U Ottawa Law, so I was kind of just interested in some of the work that your compliance department does. I don't know if there's anybody here from the compliance department, but I'd love to hear about that. Um, and also, if you guys could speak to, if you're allowed, um, if you follow any or try to emulate any other um, institutional investors in the private and public sector when you're doing your investments? What was the first, what was the first part of the question, Matthew? Sorry, just to, so it's clear. I was just asking about the work of your compliance department. Um, well, they're critical. Um, it, obviously it's really key. Um, uh, uh, you know, we steward other people's money. So we have, we have to have checks and balances across the organization and um, and that's a big part of it. Um, um, so they, they, they assure, make sure, and we have very clear rules of engagement with our board of trustees um, and the compliance folks, uh, along with our risk department, ensure that we, uh, we fo follow along. So, I mean, I think that that's, you know, a, a hugely important role um, that gives confidence up and down um, the governance stack that, that we're doing things accordingly. So absolutely, we have a, a large, and, and, and like every aspect of, of who growing compliance department. So for sure, that's a, um, a big part and an important uh, pillar of uh, in that checks and balances matrix. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. Now, uh, we're, we're just getting up to the top of the hour. Um, so I had, a, I had a few quick questions that I wanted to, I wanted to ask. Um, so Nikki, I'd like to ask you, what advice would you give to a young professional who's looking to start a career at Hoop? Well, um, so for sure, um, one of my mom's favorite sayings, she didn't make it up, but you all might know this, um, man plans and gods laugh. Um, but at the same time, she also says you still have to have a plan in place. So I think first, a good start here for young professionals is, as Michael and I were saying at the start of our journey in careers, we're looking in newspapers. Now, young professionals have forums like this. We have social media. We have an awesome marketing department that does a really good job of putting out the information about the things that we're doing, the events that we're holding. 
And then as Travis has mentioned several times, you know, it's a good idea to explore our website, explore our LinkedIn, explore anywhere we are in social media and have a good understanding of what is Hoop really about? What is Hoop supporting? Um, how can I bring what I have to Hoop and add value, but also would Hoop add value to me? So is this the place for me? So as I said earlier, also, I have a clear career planning flowchart that I revisit and I revise. And at my stage in life, it's about purpose for me. So it's not about looking for a specific career goal. It's more like, where can I work that I can really be energized and do the work, best work possible? So I would encourage young professionals to have their career flow chart, be willing to make changes, uh, network. You know, I heard that young man before ask some questions uh, about compliance. So in my mind, he's probably thinking, how can I get into Hoops Compliance Department? So he might be starting to research and see who's there that he can start networking. Um, but networking is critical. You heard all of us say at the beginning that we accidentally stumbled into Hoop and a lot of it came from people we knew in our career journeys. So just keep networking, but also be willing to change course and have some plans in place about what's your purpose and what type of organization do you want to be at? Wow, what a great conversation. I can't believe it's already, we've already spent one hour talking about uh, some great some great things, some great opportunities. Um, I, will, I wanna thank you all for, um, first of all, our panelists for joining this call. This was an excellent, excellent time together. And um, we really got to know a little more about the great people, but also the great opportunities at, at, at Hoop. And to you who joined us, um, like Michael said, uh, we had quite a few people on, or we have quite a few people on. So we want to thank you for joining us. And just as a reminder, just as a reminder, could you mute your, your phone, please? Just as a reminder, we're here every Wednesday for Ask a Professional. And this is our time to learn more about organizations and also to learn um, about different aspects from a professional standpoint. Join us this uh, Saturday for our financial literacy program um, in our community space. And this Saturday, we will be coming live to you from Nunavut. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to, to community space 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. On Tuesdays, we have our masterclass financial literacy for business, for business owners at 2 p.m. Look out for that as well. Um, and in the evening, the, 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 the one of our biggest, biggest programs, the Boss Women programs that features um, um, that uh, a training for uh, women entrepreneurs, um, black women entrepreneurs every evening, every Tuesday evening. And uh, of course, we're back on Wednesday with Ask a Professional. Thank you all for joining. Have a great rest of your afternoon and um, we'll see you in the community, community space on Saturday. Bye for now. <laughs>